Hello everybody, Razorblade Mango here, and welcome to a new series of videos that I'd like to start doing called Tales from Criterion. These are movies that are featured on the Criterion collection that I want to talk about. Uh, movies that I don't necessarily you know, own, I don't do unboxings and stuff like that on this channel. Movies that, uh, it's a combination of uh, five movies from the collection that I've maybe I've seen for the first time, some all-time favorites, some stuff that I hate, some stuff that I've uh, seen before. So it's it's five films chosen randomly by me that I will watch to give my thoughts on for this show. So, you know, if you like it, cool. And this is, this is more of an effort to bring uh, movie-related content on my channel. I know a lot of my subscriber base um, is more into like the the video game stuff, and that's definitely going to be the the prominent focus of my channel. However, you know my first and my first love for media was movies, and I still am to this day a big movie nut. So this is more of a conscious effort on my part to get back into watching movies on a regular basis because I. I've slacked off these past few years, and along with Popcorn Mango, this is just another another one of those to, to kind of give myself a push to, to watch more stuff. So, without further ado, I bring you Episode 1 of Tales from Criterion. The first film I want to talk about is Andrei Tarkovsky's Solaris. Now... I really hated this movie the first time I saw it. Like, bored out of my mind hatred. Um, because, and I guess I, I like it now. I like it quite a bit now. But back then, I was just... I could not get into it. And it was so slow. It was, it was just moved at a snail's pace. And I, I... This was at a time when... Uh, I just, I like this kind of really meditative slow stuff, just I, it was like a big barrier where I couldn't get through it, and thankfully like the older I've gotten the more I've come around to this kind of filmmaking, and I like Solaris a lot quite a bit, almost exclusively for its its atmosphere and its, its uh, editing and slow visual design, and what Solaris is about, it, it's about this doctor who is being sent into space to this station to evaluate this crew that have come under this strange uh, emotional crisis where they contemplate suicide they start hallucinating dead people that they that they know personally like dead lovers dead dead fathers dead family members and he goes up there to investigate and determine the problem and when he goes up there, he fully knows that he's probably never going to come back. Or at least if he does come back, that all of his family will have died by the time he comes back. And this is a, a heavy burden that he has to take up there with them. So I find that interesting. I find the idea of going into space, and it's kind of part of why I really liked the first half of Interstellar, where I thought... The whole Matthew McConaughey thing of, of him going into space and having that burden of him possibly never coming back until his children are maybe 70 or already dead. So that's something I find very interesting from a narrative and thematic standpoint. And that stems a lot from Solaris because a benefit of this slow pacing of Solaris is that it allows you to fully meditate and sit with these characters and it allows you to kind of get inside their head and to, to really let the, the emotions that they're feeling wash over you. And that's kind of the point of a Tarkovsky film. He doesn't, he doesn't like doing, you know, lots of edits, lots of cuts, uh, quick pace. He like, there's maybe about, if you were to cut down all of the the extra slow stuff, this movie would probably be about two hours, maybe an hour and a half 
hour and 40? But no, it's a nearly three-hour movie with all the extra meditative stuff. But without that meditation, without that that um that slow pacing it just it wouldn't feel the same it wouldn't be as hypnotic or as interesting if we weren't allowed to spend time with these characters like literally sitting in rooms with them sitting in cars with them while they drive sitting and sitting with them while they're in space and it brings this new emotional core to the film that i think just works and something I didn't notice the first time I saw it. And now is why I really, really like it. Um, and I, this is the only, I think this is the only Tarkovsky film I've ever seen. Um, Andrei Rublev and um, uh, Ivan's Childhood have been, have been on my list for quite some time. So I, I probably should do those for a for a future episode of this. But for now, I've, Solaris is the only Tarkovsky film... I've seen and I really like it. I don't know if I'll like it. I don't know if I like the other ones <laughs> the first time around, much like Solaris, because I I, I kind of hated Solaris the first time I saw it. But I hope I like them. That's all I can say. But Solaris, really good. And if you have a lot of these films, um, I think all of them actually uh, that I will talk about. If you have Hulu Plus, they're on there. So if you just look up all these films on Hulu Plus, you're you're able to watch them. And if you're in the right frame of mind, if you're into something that's very dreamlike and atmosphere driven and and slowly paced, then you might like Solaris and you might like the work of of Tarkovsky in general. So Solaris, it's really good. The next film I'm going to talk about is Fat Girl, written and directed by Catherine Braylat. I'm sorry, I suck with I suck with French names. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, Catherine Brela. So this is a film about two sisters while they're on vacation, and one of them becomes smitten by this uh, this um, traveler. And she ends up getting into a relationship with him and eventually, you know, get, loses her virginity to him. But all of this is seen through the eyes of this, the, the younger sister, who, which is the, the titular fat girl, uh, named Anais. And she is kind of a very cynical person. They're, in the beginning, they're talking about love, like, like oh I like the the older sister is like oh I want to lose my virginity to a man that I love and it will be wonderful and special and then Anais is like fuck that I want to lose my virginity to a man that I don't like because when he decides to leave I won't have any bad feelings it will just be sex or whatever and just get it over with so the whole movie is about her watching her older sister be seduced by this guy who's using the most obvious pickup seduction lines ever and um, and what's interesting about fat girl is that even though it's meant to be this drama and stuff like that i found it to be rather amusing um i guess from my point of view as a as a man watching this guy uh this italian traveler named fernando just fucking use this the, the corniest lines on her like oh like you know i will go to another woman because i have I, I i you have broken my heart if you aren't going to fuck me or and this is like a long 20 there's a long 25 minute one shot take of him trying to seduce her while they're sitting laying in bed together and she even like she has her panties off you fully see her vagina and her her breasts and everything and it's like She's still resistant to him, like no, I, like I don't, I don't want to lose it already. And keep in mind, they've only known each other for probably a day, and the the guy is already talking about how, oh, I'm gonna give you this ring as a promise, and I'll come visit you while you're you're living in Paris, and we'll be engaged and married, and it will be wonderful. And what's funny is that uh, 
I'm watching this and I'm just like, wow, dude, you, 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 you know your game, but you're also just this giant scumbag. And then I'm looking at the the girl, and I guess a problem with the movie is that the movie really does. If you can see a fault in this, it does really look down on the older sister. But maybe it's because we're seeing this film through the eyes of Anais, and Anais sees everything that this guy is doing. Even though she's the younger sister, she knows his game, and she he she knows that he he she knows what he's really after. So. I guess in a way that the the kind of looking down and condescending towards the older sister is justified because the whole movie is from Anais's pers perspective, or at least um, Id idealistic perspective. And Elena, even like when she's like, no, I don't want to have sex, she lets him have like anal with her, anal with, she lets him have anal with her because he he coerces her into being like, oh, if you have anal sex with me, it's this proof of my love of our love and stuff like that. And the sad part is is that he's getting everything out of this relationship, where she is being uh, like this whole experience, like especially having the the anal sex, and then finally when they they fuck and he, she loses her virginity, it's that she is always getting the short end of the stick. She is always the one that is is suffering in this relationship i mean she may not even recognize it and that's the sad part but she is suffering in this relationship because she she's being uh, talked into doing things she doesn't want to do and then when she wants to like there's a point where she gives him a blowjob and he goes no i don't want it no get, get away from me go so even when she wants, when, at the time when she wants it, he's like, no, I don't want it. So, again, she gets the short end of the stick. And I guess, um, I guess I'll talk about the ending. I guess spoilers here. Uh, the ending is very divisive, where uh, Anais, her sister, and her mom are driving in the car, and an axe murderer just comes out and kills the, the mom and the, and the, the sister, and rapes Anais in the woods and a lot of people seem to hate that ending and what's interesting about the ending for me is that you don't really know if it's real or not and uh, you can make a case for either because Anais probably doesn't give a shit about her sister at this point she probably doesn't care about her, or whether her mom lives or dies so seeing Imagining an axe murderer come up to the car and kill both of them seems very in character with her. And then taking, and since her viewpoint on sex, uh, at least losing your virginity, is so like like cyclical and uh, blunt and non-sexy, she really doesn't mind that uh, of a, a fantasy of an axe murderer taking her out into the woods and and raping her, raping the virginity out of her. Because she knows that he doesn't love her and she doesn't love him, so really when he leaves, there's no, there's, there's no emotional tie to this at all. It's just I'm getting I'm I'm getting my cherry pop. That's about it. That's all I'm getting out of this my, the first time I have sex. Whereas with the you know the older sister, it's all about love and, and romance and seduction, and that's not the case. So it's kind of a it's kind of a clash of two ideologies of romance and sex based on and and it leans way more towards Anais's perspective which i think honestly is the more i wouldn't say realistic but it's the more interesting perspective in my opinion the more um, cynical one so but that's just me and i to my surprise i i liked it i didn't expect to like it because i know a lot of people have just been like oh this fucking movie but i I dug it. I thought it was. I thought it was pretty good. So again, that's another one that's on Hulu, and um, I don't know what else this director has done, but I, I gotta look up more of her stuff. I mean, especially if it's like this, because I got some kind of fascinating, morbid comedy out of it. So, I, you know, that's just me. I, I like this kind of weird, cynical, morbid shit. Next film is Watership down directed by martin rosen and starring john hurt and a bunch of other actors i i don't know <laughs> so watership down guys 
This is probably one of the most disturbing, not only not only the most disturbing animated film I've ever seen, but probably the most distur one of the most disturbing uh, films in general that I've ever seen, and I I think that's a big compliment coming from me. It's it's not, and it's not disturbing on like a oh god I never want to watch this again. It's disturbing on. It knows what it's showing you is fucked up, and yet it treats you like an adult. And it gives you these, like, really adult themes and adult imagery, and it makes you go... Like, even if you're a kid and watching this, which I would never show my kid Watership Down, um, but I'm, get, I'm getting way ahead of myself. What is Watership Down about? Well, it's about this group of rabbits who try to escape their homeland... And because of one of one of them has an apocalyptic vision of the fields running red with blood, so they have to leave and go find another place to live. And it's all about their journey of escaping from their their place. And then they find um, other animals and other perils out there. And I'll leave you guys to watch the film because it's it's a damn good film. Um, I th I could potentially see this one day being. A favorite of mine and it's not there yet but I see it I see the potential because I love the mythology of this movie where in the movie it creates this new uh, origin story for animals and especially for rabbits and and owls and other predators and it's fascinating stuff and it feels like something that's you know while it is in the real world and the animals do die because of you know stuff created by humans the animals have their own mythology and the film sees that all the way through to the end it remains consistent about it so it gives this idea that you're watching something that's semi-realistic and yet semi-mythical at the same time and i find that very interesting and second thing the imagery is fucked up. It's a fucked up movie. And I can think of quite a few times where it, images were just burned into my head and will remain there permanently. Like, of course, the the album, not the album, the art cover of the poster of the rabbit being caught in the, the choke chain, like, um, that's disturbing. And then there's a scene where, of course, the, the rabbit's uh, apocalyptic vision comes true and you hear a story about how their their old homeland was gassed out by the humans, and you see this this image of the rabbits uh, going into their their holes to hide, and then the the gas comes in and kills all of them, and it, there's blood, and then the ghosts of the rabbits have these freakish looks on their faces, and it's so it's it's beautiful in the most disturbing fucked up way possible. It it looks it's just. It, it, like, that feeling in my gut where I was just like, wow, this, like, oh my god, it made my skin crawl looking at it. And, uh, blood, lots of blood in the movie, very bloody for an animated film, and I'm pretty sure people got fired for putting this in the, the children's section. Like I said, I would never show my children this. Give them nightmares. I would, I would have had fucking nightmares if I had seen this as a kid. But apparently this is a big influence on people like, um, they have an interview with Guillermo del Toro on the Criterion website where he talks about how, how Watership Down opened his eyes to the possibility of adult animation, um, which is what Studio Ghibli did for me and my, from my experience. Um, and how it's this big influence on animation, it's a big influence on drug culture, and it's a, it is an interesting film, uh, and what saddens me about it is that not a lot of people know about it. And, and pe people do know about it, but the vast majority of people don't really know about it. I think they know the poster more than they know the movie. Like, they've seen the poster, and they go, oh, that's where that's from. Well, all right, then. And another thing that's really, really good about this movie is the acting. And I rarely ever say this about animated films, but... Without a certain voice actor, you just can't get the right emotions and vibe from these these characters. And John Hurt, who's one of the, the best actors around, 
he as Hazel, he's great, and he leads the pack of like all these actors. And I, I don't, I don't know a lot of these actors, but they're cast to a T. And the dialogue and the way it's written is seems very naturalistic. It's not paced out like your average animated film where they kind of pause for a laugh or they pause. It feels like real people talking to each other, and yet. It's a bunch of, of rabbits and, and owls and birds and stuff talking to one another. And it feels naturalistic. Naturalistic voice acting, naturalistic dialogue. And another thing I really like about the movie is that it's also a very hopeful movie. Despite how dark and violent it can get in some situations, it is a very hopeful movie. A very, uh, uh, not uplifting, but it is about... You know, finding a new place in the world to live, and it's it is it does have a happy ending to an extent, and I, I will give that away. But it it is about hope. It's about finding new where new worlds, new experiences. So it's just a good movie. It's a good good animated movie. And one of the sadly, I think Criterion should release more animated movies, but. They're making a conscious effort to after Fantastic Mr. Fox and Watership Down and Fantastic Planet. And I hope they do more because animated movies deserve a spot in the Criterion Collection just as much as live action films do. Next movie is Pedro Almodovar's Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down. A very controversial movie. It was banned in Canada for a very long time. Uh, one of the few NC-17 movies released. Um, actually, it, had, it, it first had an X rating, and then it became an NC-17. And i got to be honest, looking at it now, it seems very tame. It's very tame for a, for a movie back then that was like, oh, it's, it's X rated, it's so dirty and controversial. But really, the only things I noticed that I'm like, okay, I can kind of understand... Why they would give it an X is one part where a uh, where a, a bath toy is used for a, a, to to pleasure a woman, um, and it's not super explicit. I mean, you see it, but you don't like you don't see the the vagina. You just see like the pubic hair. Um, you also get a very intense sweaty sex scene between Antonio Banderas and Victoria Abril. Uh, which is one of the highlights of the film because of how, you know, it's how <laughs> how kind of uh, funny it is from a character perspective. So the movie is about this uh, released psychiatric patient who kidnaps an actress in order to, in his words, get her to know him so that he can make her fall in love with him and then they'll get married and have kids and stuff like that. So it's a, it's... It's meant to be this dark comedy about Stockholm Syndrome. And I was rather underwhelmed by the whole thing. One, because, like I said, it's very tame by today's standards. It just kind of feels meh, aside from that sex scene. Um, and also, the film doesn't really say anything interesting, in my opinion. It's trying to make this this comedy about Stockholm Syndrome, and, and then there's this really useless subplot with the, the director of, of Abril's character wanting her back for his movie, and that really doesn't go anywhere. It feels like it's it's there just to pat out the movie. Um, and I don't know. It, it just, the whole time, I just felt like there really was nothing going on thematically. It was just saying... It was it was trying to be this this comedy, but it doesn't really have a compelling core. It's just one of those movies that I watch, and even though it has you know graphic content like the nudity and the sex in it, it just feels so flat and hollow. And I watch it so passively. And when the ending rolls around, it's you know it's, it's meant to be this it's meant to be this shocking movie where it's trying to like poke you and and get you uh, like offended and stuff like that. And I'm just kind of like, yeah, not really, not 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 really for me because I'm I'm very rarely 
shocked by anything anymore. I think the last thing, the last movie I was shocked by was was Green Room, just because of how violent it was. Which is a very good movie, by the way. You should watch that way more than Time Me Up, Time Me Down. Um, but it is, you know, it's just it's disappointing because I was hoping for something better. And I like Antonio Banderas a lot as an actor. I think he did a he did an all right job here. It's one of his first big roles, but it's just. It's so tame, and it's so thematically lacking that it it doesn't feel like a, a complete package by the end. It's just a movie that I saw it, and by the next day, I'd already immediately forgotten that I, I watched it. And the only thing I'll probably remember from the movie is the, the sex scene. That's about it, because it is a rather pretty hot sex scene, I will admit. <laughs> so, um, But, I don't know, it just... This didn't do anything for me. Felt really empty overall, which was disappointing. And the final movie I'm going to talk about on this video is the legendary, legendary persona directed by the legendary director himself, Ingmar Bergman. And as someone correctly put in one of the uh, Criterion essays, talking about persona is to film criticism what like climbing Mount Rushmore is to, to mountain climbers. It's just a film of such immense scale and ambition and thematic complexity that it's overwhelming. It's one of those movies that so much happens and it's so dense and you can take away so much from the film and there's so many interpretations out there that it's mind-boggling to try to, to break it down but I, I'm sure people have done it and I even to this day I've seen it three times now and to this day I still have trouble grasping uh, the the structure of it and and I just find it an overwhelming film experience from you know a visionary standpoint from a thematic standpoint, from an acting standpoint, it is one of the most overwhelming films I have ever seen. And I love it. I think it's great. And um, I guess the thing that strikes me the most about it is the, the imagery. Because the movie wouldn't work half as well if it didn't have Sven Nikovist, Nikovist uh, working on the cinematography. And of course, he's he's a legend. So And the film, of course, has beautiful images like the... The shot of their faces crossing at the end where they're they're in complete shadow and their lips are kind of crossed together and, and not touching but they're crossed. It's it's the it's the image that's on the the DVD and Criterion Blu-ray. Uh, beautiful shot, one of my all-time favorites. Um, I love the shot at the beginning where the boy strokes the projection of the the of, um, B.B. Anderson and Liv Ullman's characters. I uh, love that. I love the part where B.B. Um, Anderson's character talks about uh, a, for, a foursome she had with a, a stranger and, and two younger boys that got her pregnant where she had to have an abortion. I fucking, I love the way um, Anderson says that story and it's it's great acting on her part. Um, Liv Ullman, who's great, even though she barely says a word during the movie, um... And another thing is, it, I don't think this would have worked as well if it wasn't shot in black and white. And as much as I love seeing Bergman films in color, because he is, he was, he was a, a god when it came to visual imagery and, and cinematic you know, poetry. He was, he was a visionary, like unlike any other. Um, it, black and white allows you to really grasp the thematic stuff that's going on like the the dual identities the themes of um losing oneself and insanity and the uh, the relationship that these two have and how their personalities start to blend into a single person where even like other people start to mistake the other for the other person and it's such a a weird trippy movie but it is it's awesome <laughs> it's such an awesome movie um Another thing I, I greatly admire about Ingmar Bergman's work, and that of course extends to Persona, is how short his films are. Like, unlike a lot of filmmakers that 
especially these days, that feel the need to go on and on and on and try to make something that's like two and a half hours, three hours, two hours, and then they don't have anything to say beyond that. Ingmar Bergman, he gets in there and he gets out quick. Where he, This film is less than 90 minutes, and yet it has more thematic and visual richness than most films I've seen within the past like pretty much all my life like the most this film has that spark and it it keeps it going until it needs to be extinguished until you you get the experience you get the themes you get what's going on and it leaves you wanting more because you want to know what's going on you want to know more about persona you want to know more about these characters but ingmar bergman being the master that he is says nope 84 minutes is all you need, 84 minutes is all I need to make my film and to say what I've got to say. And I admire the fuck out of him for that. I and mean, he's done that, of course, with Seven Seal, he did that with, um, uh, with uh, Virgin Spring, Cr and I, don't know about, I don't remember much about Cries and Whispers, but you know, Virgin Spring, Seven Seal, Hour of the Wolf, he makes short films, but those short films have so much density to them that they're like a, 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 this is kind of a cliche, but it's a present you can just keep unwrapping and unwrapping and unwrapping, and, and there's so much depth and complexity to it. But I will be talking a lot, probably like Bergman, Kurosawa, and Wes Anderson are like the three filmmakers that I probably will talk the most about on this program, but it, because they're three of my favorite directors, I, I, I love all three of those directors, um... And we don't get a lot of them like them these days. Uh, Anderson, Bergman, and Kurosawa. So I'm happy to finally, finally be talking about a, a Bergman film on here because Bergman's Bergman's great. And if you're interested in getting into film at all, almost all of his films are on Hulu Plus and are supported by the Criterion Collection. So Persona is just one of the many, many excellent films from him i mean you've got virgin spring you got seven seal you've got um wild strawberries and uh, just so much good stuff and he's such a great filmmaker was such a great filmmaker so yeah that's uh that's the first episode of tales from criterion hope you guys liked it um i'm still trying to get the the, the flow and ebb of the show going so forgive me if i sound a little choppy um but yeah, let me know what you think of the show. Let me know if there's movies on Criterion that you'd recommend to me that I you want me to cover on the show. This is this is this will be a, a combination of what I want to talk about and what you guys want me to talk about. Like if there's movies that you love that are Criterion, let me know and I will talk about them. If they're on Hulu Plus or if I can get them legally. So anyway, thank you guys for watching. If you like to see, subscribe. Just yeah, let me know if there's any movies that you love that you want me to watch. So thank you guys for watching. Have a good one.